Thank you, uh, Lakshmi, and thank you for the wonderful opportunity to be part of this uh, very exciting conversation. Uh, I appreciate uh, Brian Penpraise's uh, help in organizing this. When Brian told me about this uh, beginning plans for this, uh, I guess it was six or eight months ago, I said, if there's any way I can be part of it, Pomona College can be more of a part of it, this is really exciting to us. So it's been great to have this opportunity. So I'm going to say, speak relatively briefly about Pomona College, and I want to give a little bit of the history because uh, as was mentioned yesterday, history defines what we are now, and so we really need to look at our history to think about our identity at the present time. Uh, Pomona College um, dates back to 1887, okay? It's interesting to hear about the history of some of the Indian institutions as well yesterday. Pomona College, like most, like virtually all private institutions uh, in the United States, is a college originally with a religious foundation. Uh, like Harvard and Yale, when they were established in 1600s and 1700s, it was church groups that established them, and Pomona was no exception. Uh, we were a Congregationalist founding, the very last one they went all the way across the country, starting colleges in the Northeast first, and then in the Midwest, and then in the West. In 1887, they reached California, and so it has an original religious foundation. But the religious connections have you know, long since disappeared. I think they persist, though, in some of the values that we have, uh, the idea that we're dealing with the whole student. It's not just about professional training for particular jobs. It's thinking about the role and the value of the entire student, uh, their, their personal development as well as their intellectual development. That's a core aspect of a residential liberal arts college in the United States. So we describe ourselves actually as a college of the New England type, although we're located in California. Uh, so we are a successor to all of those colleges, beginning with Harvard and Yale and Amherst and Williams and other colleges, some of which have remained small and some of which have grown and become universities. Uh, so there's been a change in character for a number of institutions, which originally started out very much like us. If you look at Harvard in the 1850s, it wasn't too different from Pomona College in the 1890s. Uh, but whereas Harvard eventually grew and made the decision to become a big university, Pomona College made a very different choice, and it actually led to a rather dramatic experiment in higher education that I'd like to say a few words about, and that is the Claremont College's experiment. So Pomona College, founded in 1887, became larger. Uh, there was pressure, a lot of students wanted to enroll, um, and there was a small graduate uh, school that we were running, and we could have, at that time, in the 1920s, grown into a university. We could have become like some of the Eastern um, and Midwestern universities. But the president at the time, our fourth president, James Blaisdell, had a vision that he felt there was real advantage in staying small, but having an advantage of scale. And so the concept that he created, this was in the 1920s, was to create a group of colleges connected to each other, working together with each other, so each one would have the advantage of small scale, but that together we could be a much larger institution. So that was the vision in the 1920s, a very dramatic and bold educational experiment, uh, which as far as I know has not taken place in exactly this form in, in other places. There are others which are exploring these opportunities now in the 21st century, but this was back in the 1920s. And so instead of allowing Pomona to keep growing and become a university, um, in a far-sighted way, he said, let's take the land that we have, and there was a gift of land uh, by one of his donors, um, Alan Browning Scripps of the Scripps Publishing Company, a gift of land to start an entire group of colleges. And so we have the advantage, the Claremont Colleges, we are located right next to each other, immediately across the street from us is Claremont McKenna College, uh, immediately to the north is Scripps College, and so forth. Um, so the colleges started in the 1920s. Scripps and Claremont Graduate University were the first established in the 1920s. Then with the Depression and the war, there was a pause in establishing new colleges. In the just after the war in the late 1940s, Claremont McKenna College started originally as a men's college. Scripps has always been and remains a women's college. Claremont McKenna was originally a men's college that later became co-educational. Then in the 1950s, Harvey Mudd College, which specializes in science and engineering. And then in the 1960s, Pitzer College uh, is the uh, fifth undergraduate college to be established. And we now have Keck Graduate Institute for Biotechnology, which is a second graduate college. So we have two graduate institutions, five undergraduate institutions. Each of us is small. 
Uh, we have different areas of focus. Pomona, I would say, is the broadest in terms of curricular coverage. We are a full, broad liberal arts college. We have a balance, fairly equal numbers of students studying the sciences, the social sciences, and the arts and humanities, so broad curriculum. The other colleges have specialized a bit more, and you'll hear a little bit from Hiram Chodosh, uh, my colleague here from Claremont McKenna, about uh, some of their directions, in, especially in some of the social science areas of emphasis. Uh, Scripps College historically emphasized arts and humanities, although they've broadened as well. Uh, Harvey Mudd, as I mentioned, science and engineering. Pitzer College has emphasized areas like sociology, psychology, anthropology, and experiential learning, and international, a lot of international work. So those are the uh, brief introduction to Pomona and the Claremont Colleges. And as I say, each of us is small. Each of us has different missions. We have each has our own president. We have our own board of trustees, our own governance, our own faculties, but a lot of close collaboration between the colleges so that we have the advantage of small scale, that we can treat students in a very personal, individualized fashion, but we have the advantage of larger scale, that students can take courses on any campus. Our calendars are completely coordinated. You can take literally a 9 o'clock course on our campus and a 10 o'clock course on the Scripps campus and then go over to Pitzer for an 11 o'clock course or whatever it might be. Uh, we are close enough that students can do that, and we can therefore cooperate very closely academically uh, between our institutions. Together, if you look at our entire Claremont College's configuration, we are comparable in scale to Princeton University, okay, with graduate and undergraduate programs, and that balance as a group of Claremont Colleges, think of us a little bit like Princeton, okay? So that's an interesting way to think about our scale and the way in which we take advantage of that. So to me, that's one of the very exciting things uh, about the Claremont Colleges and that Pomona College, as the founding member of this consortium, uh, it would be really interesting to see whether there are opportunities both for collaboration and, and perhaps even for establishment of consortia uh, in this country. I, I think it's an exciting model for us each to stay small. Pomona College is the, actually the largest of the five undergraduate colleges, but when I say large, I mean 1,500 students, okay? That's, that's our, the largest. The others range from 800 to, I believe, 1,200 uh, is the range of size of the other colleges. So we are the largest, but ourselves still small. We are virtually fully residential. 98% of our students live on campus, and that residential experience is a key aspect of what students uh, have on our, our campus. 1,500 students at Pomona College, two, 200 faculty members. Um, so there's a very close interaction between faculty and students. Our instruction is based on discussion-based classes, small discussion-based classes. Uh, Faculty-student interactions in and outside the classroom. Uh, we have a broad curriculum, but a lot of individual attention. Students are able to get involved very early on in research with faculty. Uh, for example, in the sciences, students after their first year may be spending the summer engaged in research in labs with faculty. So we have all of those opportunities uh, at, at Pomona. We have one of the things we encourage as a liberal arts college is different pathways for students. There are many different ways to get to a given goal, and students can change, as you know, in the course of their four years on campus. They can change their minds about what they want to do. But for example, if you have a particular professional goal in mind, suppose you have decided you want to do medicine, um, you don't have to be a major in biological sciences. Maybe you will choose that, but you could be an English major and go on to, to medicine. If you want to study law, maybe a physics background would be a great combination, a great background for an eventual law degree. Or if you want to go into business, we have many examples. Um, one of our trustees in Hong Kong, who was a major businessman, Bernie Chan, uh, Bernie Chan uh, studied studio art. He was a studio art major at Pomona College, and he will talk about how that major and the creativity that it developed in him has affected and uh, changed his own business career. Uh, so that's part of the goal. Uh, we are not against professions. Our students go on to do many different things, uh, but they, they come from many different paths to get to those points. Okay. So um, we have smallness, we have the scale with the Claremont Colleges, and I think we have many of the advantages of the small college as well as of the bigger Research One universities. There was some funny conversation that took place over the summer uh, because uh, we've talked a little bit about rankings yesterday, and I'd be the first person to say rankings <laughs> don't mean that much, and if you're up one year, the next year you're likely to be way down, so I don't want to uh, emphasize this too much, but Forbes magazine last summer came out with a ranking which purported to compare all the colleges and universities in the United States. Um, for 
various factors, including the rate of graduation, how many people graduate in four years, the affordability, financial aid, diversity, and outcomes. They looked at who was getting things like Fulbright fellowships and so forth. And this ranking came out with Stanford University number one, Pomona College number two, followed by Princeton and Yale and Harvard and others and so on. So we really enjoyed that. Not that it proves anything, but it led to some conversations about what is the value of a particular college and that experience. Uh, what do our students get out of it? And uh, so it led to some interesting attention and conversations. Um, so those are some of the, the um, comments about the uh, institution. I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, showing a few pictures if that's set up. Is that uh, set up? To uh, just to give you a, a little flavor of our campus uh, over a few minutes so you can see um, the way we work together. Um, so let's see, how do I advance? I'll move fairly fast. I just wanted to uh, give a little image of our, of our campus, uh, which um, we have this is California, but we have mountains. Uh, in this is Los Angeles area. We are 35 miles, 50 kilometers east of Los Angeles is our location. Um, the, this is uh, some of our academic buildings. Uh, our, one of our oldest buildings, Marston Hall of, of Music. One of our academic buildings, Carnegie Hall, where we have economics and political science. Uh, uh, use that building. This is our big auditorium, which uh, also serves some of the other Claremont colleges for big meetings, 2,500 seats in our auditorium. This is our theater. We run the drama program, the theater program, for all the Claremont colleges. It's an example of a joint program run by one of the colleges rather than all of us together. This is uh, some science buildings. We have uh, biology and neuroscience and chemistry behind that. Um, this is our building for the languages, modern languages, and for history uh, department in this uh, wonderful building. Here we have a uh, small discussion in office with an advanced German class. This is a very small class, as you can see, and a, a bigger discussion. This is a religious studies class, one of our faculty members uh, leading a discussion around the table here. Um, here we have a geology class, uh, Eric Grofis, professor of geology here. Uh, with students, uh, in this case, working on uh, computer-related work. Our new uh, biology lab opened about 10 years ago. Uh, we are now uh, building a new um, uh, physics and math uh, laboratory. Here is our uh, chemistry uh, laboratory. Again, this is a faculty member and a student uh, doing research here. We have a lot of students, several hundred students, doing research each summer. They do a poster conference uh, in which they show their results at the end of the year. This is our orchestra. We have an orchestra and a choir and a glee club, a lot of performing arts as well as theater. I mentioned dance in those areas. This is the sky space, James Terrell, a major artist who's a Pomona College graduate who designed this space uh, on our campus. The residential life is very important. This is one of our new residence halls um, um, for, for undergraduates, for our students. Um, dorm room conversations, a lot of the education goes on inside uh, the dorms on our campus. Uh, this is one of the student eating spaces on campus in our campus center, which again brings uh, students and faculty together in different ways. This is our campus center, uh, which uh, has all of those uh, different activities, including meeting rooms um, in it. And let me just end with this and leave this up if you could. Uh, this is the last uh, uh, picture of the show. These are the words on our gates, and these are words, um, if I could, I, can I go back to that and, and stay on that? Um, I'll just say, I, I could just recite the words. Uh, James Blaisdell, whom I mentioned, who is our fourth president, um, wrote these words and they've been put on our gates and they sort of stand for uh, the key message that we have. Uh, they only are loyal to this college who, departing, bear their uh, added g gifts, uh, their added treasures in trust for mankind. You can't actually read the whole message there, but okay, uh, never mind. Um, I just wanted to say that the commitment that Blaisdell said bear your gifts in trust. The, the added riches that you've been given through your college education is something, it's not something that you own, that you possess. It's something that you hold in trust for future, for the future and for the rest of the world. And so there's a real commitment to giving back, to helping the world in different ways. And I'll just close with two examples of that, which have interesting international dimensions. Um, one of them is one of our alumni, uh, Brian Tucker, uh, who has created a firm called Geohazards, and he's working internationally to reduce the effect of major uh, tsunamis and earthquakes. Um, and he works out of Palo Alto. 
and has had a major impact uh, already in Indonesia in developing infrastructure for the next tsunami to prevent the extreme damage that took place from the most recent one. So that's one example. Another example is something that came to my mind um, when I was a week or so ago, I was down in Trivandrum in Kerala and opened the India Times on Sunday and saw an article, uh, Dateline Trivandrum, which talked about a student coming from Trivandrum and it talked about a project he'd, he'd worked on which was having an impact in India and it, his several collaborators, one of whom, Jane Chen, I said, Jane, I know Jane, she's a Pomona alumna. Okay, so here we have a collaboration of several students, including one of our alumni, who've developed um, a baby warmer uh, idea. This is something where uh, for prematurely born babies, rather than the very expensive hospital type of treatment that's required, would be used in the United States, in a developing country or in a country with fewer resources, much less expensive way of saving lives, and it's already saved 40,000 lives. So it's an example of the international collaborations that we have. I think the liberal arts um, have been, liberal arts colleges have been described in the past as distinctively American. I think that's really changed over recent time. It's great to be here, part of this conversation in India. We've been having discussions with um, Hong Kong about changing their education, moving in a more liberal arts college direction. Uh, next month, uh, the Princess of Thailand, Princess Sarindhorn, will be visiting the Claremont Colleges. Pomona will be giving her an honorary degree. And we're talking with Thailand about bringing the liberal arts there. And so these conversations are taking place internationally. And it's uh, very exciting to be part of these discussions. Thank you. So with those uh, remarks, I'd be happy to uh, take any, any questions from any of you. Thank you for this, and it's always inspiring, um, particularly to hear the vision of the um, garland in a way. I think of the Claremont campuses as a kind of garland of different um, small liberal arts approaches within a, a broader campus. Um, so we heard yesterday about the basic fact that I hear a lot of colleagues talking about, at least those who are from America, and I have to deal with this constantly, which is, just as liberal arts is becoming this very exciting new way of thinking in Asia and other parts, um, South America, et cetera, um, it is America's you know, top global export to educationally. Uh, I don't believe this statement. I would argue with it on every level, but that's, this is what we hear. Uh, and uh, just as that's happening at liberal arts, is, um, there's a new consortium. You may be a member of it, of liberal arts college presidents. Mm -hmm. Um, who are trying to make a case for liberal arts in, a, in, the Amer in America at a time when it's deeply besieged. Um, public large research universities are besieged in other ways, um, but we are struggling with a kind of new uh, credentializing culture. Um, my Duke students talk about their struggle with Duke's credentializing culture all the time. Um, so this group of college, uh, small liberal arts college presidents feel like they need to become activists in the United States. And so it's a deep irony if it's true. I'm not sure it's true, but if it is, let's take the hypothesis for a second. Um, how would you think about re-importing liberal arts back to the United States so that it becomes intelligible to itself? That would be. That's, that's a yeah. very good question. And it is ironic, as you say, that at the time when the rest of the world is discovering the liberal arts, the United States, to some extent, has been turning its back. And uh, we are part of that active movement to uh, make the case in the United States uh, for the liberal arts against just credentialing and narrow training and so forth. Uh, sure, people need jobs, but we are successful uh, in our colleges in preparing people for a variety of uh, creative careers. And uh, so the idea that you need to have very narrow training is a complete falsehood. So we're really working on that. And as I say, uh, as you say, we get energy from these types of discussions internationally. I was at another meeting um, over in Europe uh, talking with some of the 
university rectors uh, from new institutions in the former Soviet bloc. And they are trying to build liberal arts into their curricula because they are building democracies in their country. And it's a key component for them to build liberal arts education in their universities to prepare for democracy. We have all the same issues. So we need to get some of that excitement and energy from the rest of the world back to the United States. And we're very much part of that effort. Yes. Uh, oh. Uh, you began by saying about the inception of the institution uh, with some religious institution or a kind of a religious dogma. At the same time, you want to maintain the values of it. Now, this is a very difficult question, actually as difficult as you are trying to answer her about importing liberal uh, attitudes. And separating religion and values has not been very easy for the modern man. That's a, that's a very good point. And, and we as an institution have no, certainly have no religious position. We have students from all different religious groups and some who are not religious. We welcome conversations about religion uh, led by students, uh, inviting faculty and so forth who, who have interest in these uh, discussions. We also very much welcome conversations about values. Uh, but we want to uh, have these discussions in a very free and open environment where no one should feel uh, pushed in one direction or feel that they can't speak about some subject. So the idea of free and open conversation discussion about all sorts of issues, uh, including very controversial issues, is something that's at the very core of our, uh, of our existence. And what Laurie talked about yesterday, some of those conversations will make people uncomfortable. And that's what should happen. Uh, we need to have some should uncomfortable happen. conversations. Students. Uh, even within the United States, the kind of exposure you have to the kind of subjects at your class 12 level, and when yes. you move into college, you have a wider range. And how do you really bridge that um, gap between the wider range of subjects which they are exposed to during their first year of undergraduation in terms of helping them to make their choices? Given the option also that you also have students who come from international mm -hmm backgrounds, right. they also come with very different school curriculums and this broad range of choice of subjects mm -hmm. is something that I think students grapple with in terms of making those choices. Yes. That is question number one. Sure. The second is, I would really would want you to sort of, um, I know it's not directly sort of drawing on your experience but would like to sort of get from you the opinion of what would this mean to a country like India which is actually talking of scale because we really do not have the luxury of having small classrooms. Mm -hmm. Given that reality, what is that that we can take away from your experience that would be more relevant for India, mm -hmm. for more relevant for the larger India, rather than relevant for the okay. uh, elite Thank or you. privileged? Okay, uh, to the answers to your two questions. First, uh, I think that we do uh, have students from a wide variety of backgrounds. We don't have a core curriculum for the first year, but we have a curriculum that's flexible enough that it takes students from very different backgrounds and prepares them for the next step. We have uh, writing emphasis, courses with writing emphasis for students with different writing backgrounds and so on. And additional tutoring for students who might not be ready for a particular course. So I think our, our first year courses do bring students together so that they're ready by their second and third years uh, to be in all the same courses together. Your second question, I think there's a lot of things I could say, and that is uh, that uh, <laughs> there's <laughs> um, the idea of liberal education is something that is very broad in the United States. I was chair of the board of the Association of American Colleges and Universities, which has a wide variety of institutions, uh, some as small as us or smaller, some as large as Miami-Dade Community College, 200,000 students. It's the largest college in the United States. It draws a very diverse background of students in Florida from the Miami area, and they have a commitment to liberal arts education, which starts at the very beginning. You can teach liberal arts also in big classes. I've taught classes of 250 and taught them in a way that engages students, gets them part of their education. You can break students into small groups in the middle of the class, have them work together on something, uh, and so forth. So there are ways of doing active learning even in much larger classes. I guess my time's up. Thank you.